today's cards are going to be um, the chariot number six, uh, okay, number seven, strength number eight, the hermit number nine, and the wheel of fortune number ten. So let's um, let's go right into it because we got a lot of material to cover here. So. Major Arcana number six. Uh, I'm sorry, number seven. The Chariot. And uh, lots of symbolism here. The two sphinxes, uh, which is a duality of mind type of uh, symbol. The, uh, the cross with the wings on top. Uh, and a little... Um, Kind of like a little wheel on a on a on a on a, on a gear a gear type of symbol, representing representing the intelligence of mankind, the intelligence of human beings to uh, accomplish technological feats, the uh, kind of science of the mind. The figure is armed. He's got a couple of, of moons on his shoulders representing mysteries he's also crowned he's a male um, he's got a little wand on him uh, the chariot represents the movement forward in space and time of mankind uh, it represents the ability of mankind to conquer the elements uh, and uh, go where no man has gone before. In the olden times, chariot races represented the uh, still they still do in a sense um, the uh, apex or the um, the cutting edge of technology because chariots were not just <coughs> based on the on the strength of the horse but also on the capacity of the builders of these chariots to build a better meaner leaner chariot uh, <coughs> today we still do that you know with the, the car races NASCAR I guess you call it um, but it, it's still basically the same quest the quest for speed uh, through technology so the chariot is a technological card it's a card that explains to us that we have dominion over the elements society not nature is what is in charge of this that we can see that because of the city behind this chariot the uh, person in the chariot is man as a kind of triumphant uh, fellow, he's he's getting all this egg, uh, wonderful uh, capacity to 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 move himself through time and space. Uh, the the one star crown on his head represents, and, and I think it's got yeah, it's got eight points. It represents the ability to guide himself through the darkness. It's the uh, the star represents Venus, beauty. Uh, but it also represents the ability to penetrate the mysteries of the night. Uh, the chariot is a triumphant card. It is a card that demonstrates the ability of mankind to triumph over the environment. Um, very interesting, the two sphinxes, well, it takes it really, really takes us back to Egypt. And... Uh, you know, these cards were made before flight was a common event, a common day event. Mankind was always dreaming of flying. And it gives us a little preview of the fact that mankind, through divine intelligence, which is represented by the two sphinxes, is going to eventually have the capacity for flight and even stellar flight because the stars are the canopy of the chariot. So. Here's, here's a very clear indication of the prophetic elements that go into the tarot uh, major arcana. 
uh, the guys that drew these things did not know about space flight yet. I think they had hot air balloons at some point in their time, but they didn't have air they didn't have airplanes. So this card is kind of demonstrating us that there is a prophetic element in this uh, cartomancy uh, business, and it's pretty cool. Okay. Uh, it's a male figure, um, the uh, two sphinxes representing the two polar brain. Now how do we, how do we get from a sphinx to a brain, right? Well, the mysteries of the sphinx, the mysteries of, of all of the, uh, all of the secret societies that are worth their mantle, all, all, the, all of these serious secret societies that kind of study um, the nature of the universe and uh, you know, like the Masons and the, the Templars and all those cats, they got one thing in common and that thing is Egypt. Now, the Masons particularly and the OTO, which is the uh, <coughs> secret society that inspired these cards, and they were very in touch with Masonic uh, lodges. The Masons basically go back to Egypt for their wisdom. The, 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 the wisdom of the Egyptians is what they promote, and uh, Anubis, Sat, um, Thoth, uh, Ra, Isis, Osiris, all these gods are kind of like the stars on their firmament that permit them to take control over the material world through their magic. Now the Sphinx is one of the greatest mysteries of Egypt. They don't really know how old it is, they don't really know, you know, that much about her, or what they do know. <coughs> is that the technology necessary for the construction of such a, a monument theoretically, and obviously theoretically because the fact is that it exists pyramids, the three pyra the three great pyramids that are next to Sphinx, was not exist. They did not have the technology necessary for doing these huge pyramids. So there's a mystery. There's a historical anthropological mystery, paleontological mystery. Is there such a word as paleontological? God, I'm such a southern fried chicken. There, there's a huge mystery about the pyramids, and they, and the Sphinx is, is definitely related to this mystery because it's right there for us all to see. And the Masons and all these cats, you know, they they get very, they get kind of at the, at the deeper levels, they get kind of spooky and uh, spiritual about it. <coughs> <coughs> if you study guys like he uh, Heineken, Heinlein. Chariots of the God, God's guy. Well, he tells us that you know there was ancient technologies that they could fly, that they could make fit in cities fly. In fact, in the Hindu scriptures, there is such mention of Bima, uh, vimanas, which are flying cities, basically, and they were destroyed by you know weapons that resemble the sun, you know, nuclear explosions. So there's a whole. Um, there's a whole train of uh, mystical, magical societies, um, primary of which is Blavatsky, which makes us think that there was a, a world, uh, an advanced world before ours that got destroyed by their stupidity and that we do that cyclically, that you know we return to back to the Stone Age through our own stupidity various times. We haven't been able to break into the stars. Now he, here is Captain Kirk, and there's the Enterprise. This is the guy that has gone where no man has gone before. The Star Rover, the Star Traveler, and that's the the great secret of the of the chariot is it is not an Earth-bound chariot; it is a star-bound chariot, and it demonstrates us that our objective, our purpose, our clear and present desire is to abandon this planet at some point and uh, go to the stars. Now, that's a big stretch 
a middle age drawing of a guy drawn by two sphinxes, but the sphinxes represent that, represent the stars and the star knowledge and the Atlantean or Atlantean Atlantean um, world which was pre Noah's flood and which was very advanced but somehow spiritually uh, primitive and that's why it was self-destroyed it destroyed itself and that's a prevalent theme amongst, uh, amongst a lot of these secret societies so uh, they consider themselves Atlanteans most of them uh, there's some truth to that the new Atlantis and all that stuff it's, it's very real to the to the folks that are in the know with these type of um, of things you know so chariot the two moons uh, on his shoulders again represent that and then another little interesting symbol here which I forgot to mention is a square he's got a on, on his uh, on his breastplate he's got a, a clear white square now the square is the measure of a cubit and a cubit is kind of like the dominion of man over matter again this whole card is telling us showing us how man can triumph over matter to go to the stars in purely a divinatory uh, purposes for purely a divinatory purposes the chariot represents the movement of a person from one place to another that is necessary and uh, uh, and useful um, what type of movement well the vacation to Europe um, changing houses changing states changing nations uh, moving out of some place or into some place uh, the chariot is going to show you movement it's going to mo make you move so when you pull out the chariot for your clients 99.9% .9 of the time there is some type of physical transportation of that client from one place to another on a rather permanent basis usually it's it's either a long vacation or a just you know changing of, of, of the place where they live so anyways that's the chariot that's number seven. Number eight. Strength. And uh, here we have the same character that we've seen before, the Empress, the, the, the High Priestess. And this time she's uh, in a nice kind of sunny day. Uh, opening the jaws of a lion-like beast at her feet. The beast looks meek. The, the, the tail of the beast is between her tail, uh, between her legs, which is very telling. There is a, a, a griddle of uh, flowers on her, on her waist. And over her head, there are also some flowers, but a new kind of flowers, but also the uh, the upside down or the, 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 the sideways number eight which represents infinity it's the same figure that we found on the magician and it is the symbol for infinite divine knowledge um, in this card although it says strength obviously it says strength we're not talking about physical strength we're talking about moral ethical and spiritual strength the ability of a human being to uh, find and conquer the beast which lies within their own heart. The, 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 the figure here, the, the lady, is our intelligence, is our wisdom, is our capacity to differentiate the good and evil aspects of our lives and to see clearly this distinction of what is useful and what is not useful in our lives and to work for what is useful, to act for what is correct, um, if I were a Christian or some type of, you know, uh, 
person that believed in sin, I would probably say it is the ability to conquer sin. And uh, conquering sin, it's uh, is a very practical thing because, in some way, um, sin represents all those activities which are harmful to others. And this person has reined in those activities. This person has conquered these activities, but is also playing with them. We're not talking about a, a person that avoids their dark side. We're talking about a person that has conquered their dark side. I, I tell my clients all day long, I tell my clients, look, man, um, you, you can make yourself stupid about it, but if you don't know why you're acting badly, or what you are doing to act badly, you're never going to change it. And even if you know you're acting badly and you don't want to change it, you're not going to change it. So the, the, the intelligence here, the intelligence aspect of this card is the ability for your client to see what they're doing wrong and to change it the desire and ability to change it. Because obviously, if you don't want to change something, you're not going to change it. But here in this this, uh, this card of strength, your client finally has come to the realization that they need to change something within themselves that is doing them harm, and that somehow, through this change, they will become stronger, a stronger human being. Now, Another element of this is that the beast, or I think it's a lion, looks like a lion. The beast is added to the strength of the intelligence that is represented by the lady. What does that mean? That means, let's say that you're in a battlefield situation, and suddenly, you know, you gotta be wise about, you know, maybe not robbing and raping and looting when you conquer a town, but you also have to be able to defend yourself from the enemy soldiers. The beast is a necessary and useful element of our personality. You can't just destroy the beast, you can't just eliminate the beast, you have to tame the beast. That means The beast represents our instinctual nature. Any of you guys that has done serious psychedelics, serious drug, any type of drugs, will realize that the use of certain psychedelics fine tunes or enhances or strengthens instinct. That means you take a hit of peyote, suddenly you can run faster, you can feel stronger. You may not have as much um, uh, problem walking around naked because you're not so worried about moral implications of what you're doing, but you will definitely feel stronger. You will feel more capable of doing um, physical feats of strength. You will have your senses strong. You have the little spider sense like Peter Parker. You will know when the shit's coming down. You may not be able to distinguish, um, you know, the situation just clearly because you'll be in a hallucinatory mood. But you will feel things stronger. So, the beast, that's the beast. The Nawal, the shapeshifter, the werewolf. The werewolf is a stronger more animalistic version of ourselves but it is a wild part it's a wild unruly part of ourselves so in this strength card our intelligence our capacity to dominate our lower instincts dominates but does not destroy tames but does not annihilate that beast which can be so useful in a bar fight, okay? Um, I'm not saying that you need to become werewolves to be strong, 
But I am saying that if you find your inner beast and you accept it and you kind of embrace it, you can use the strength of that beast to act on the world. Give a perfect example. In Native American culture, you have your totem animal, and you go into the vision quest to find out who is your totem animal, who is your your animal strength. You can find a, a flying animal, or maybe a, a, a big whale, or you know, whatever. Um, I found the octopus for myself. I don't know, <laughs> weird animal, but that's what I found. Anyways. You find your totem animal, you can use the strength of that am animal in your life because suddenly you realize how you use the techniques of that animal, the, the survival uh, techniques of that animal in your own life to do your own stuff. The um, Mexican tradition is the Nawal. The Nawal is a shapeshifter. That is not just you any werewolf that turns into a wolf with the full moon. This is an actual voluntary shapeshifter. Usually they take the form of either uh, panthers, jaguars, or wolves. Some of them take coyote form. They, they take a variety of different forms. But the most common are those birds. They, they also turn into birds quite often. The brujas in, in the northern Mexico usually become um, huge birds that are half bird, half woman. They can scare peop the bejeez out of people you find on the, the desert. Kind of like a harpy looking thing. Anyways, that's the beast. You're using your intelligence, you're using your wisdom to control, that's the word, control the beast within. Alright, and that's the uh, eight of the major arcana. Card number nine. And the ba da 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 stairway to heaven. You guys remember that uh, Led Zeppelin album? This is the cover of the Led Zeppelin album. Smart guys, those guys. Hermit. The Hermit. Well, let's go to ancient. Um, ancient um, Viking lore. And the hermit is Wotan, Odin, the fellow that went for the large brimmed hat in his in the old lord, in only one eye, and uh, a staff or a spear, long white beard, walked alone for the world. The uh, Jews have a tradition of a hermit, it's called the Wandering Jew which is said to be Judas, the guy that betrayed Jesus and was condemned to eternal life, that he didn't die on the, on the, on the, on the hanging tree. Uh, so, um, the hermit basically is the pilgrim, because he's going somewhere. He's at night, you know, he's trapped in gray clothes, and he's looking down into the where he's going exactly the opposite of the fool, isn't he? This guy has knowledge. He's got a light. He, he's not going to fall down because he's carrying a light. He knows where he's going. The hermit has realized that all the paths that he's taken before have not taken him to the tranquility of the soul. Because somehow he is stuck. Um, and he can't follow anymore anybody. He's got to follow his own his own drummer, his own beat. Uh, the hermit is man searching for himself. He is the guy that goes into the night to find the light that lies within his own heart. He is a figure like strength. Remember, there's a progression of the soul here. Once you dominate the beast within, the next thing you need to do is to break away from all the stuff that is going around you. And, uh, you know, all the great masters did it. Jesus went 40 days and 40 nights into the desert. 
Moses went into the mountain. Muhammad went into the desert. Um, Buddha went uh, in, into um, the woods, the forest. All the great uh, prophets, saints, and masters. Um, Saint Germain, all of them have gone into the woods or into the desert or into seclusion to find within their solitude uh, the truth. And uh, this is a prescribed form of illumination. It is what you must do if you need to find yourself, you need to go into seclusion away from everybody. It is a form of death. It is a form of being dead. You isolate yourself from everybody. You go into a dangerous place like the desert of the mountains or the woods. Well, you don't know if you're gonna come back out, do you? It's, it's a way of it's a way of letting go of yourself so you can find yourself. Now the hermit, this guy, he's not looking up. He's not looking for God. He's looking for the way. Which way he's look? What what road or what path is he looking for? He's looking for, for the path back home because if you notice at his feet, there's some rocky snow looking, mountain looking thing, and it can't be very comfortable. It's cold out there in the big bad world. It's a cold, heartless world, the world of the hermit. And when he goes into seclusion, when he goes into into solitude, well, he's got to deal with himself, which is the biggest adversary you will ever have. <sighs> so, the hermit is the guy that is alone. Oh. By the way, uh, like the chariot, this is a card. Of the card of strength signifies health. It, it demonstrates health, fortitude, triumph. Things go the way you want it because you have the strength to manifest them and all that stuff. That should be self-evident after a while. But anyways, in the hermit. Well, it's a dark moment in the soul, for the soul. The, the, the path of the hermit is not a light. Uh, you know, in, the, in these cards, you can always tell when something's good or bad, basically if it's day or night. Night represents the night of the soul, day represents the day of the soul. So the, the hermit is a, is a dark moment in, for the soul because it's a moment of solitude. But it is a moment of strength, too, because you've already passed through strength. You are strong enough to become a hermit. Um, and although he's looking for the way, and he's got the map and the, and the manner to get to the way, he has not found it yet. He's not going to fall down because he's got his walking stick with him. He's not going to, you know, he's going to find the way. And that's for sure. But he is not there yet. He is not where he wants to be. He is in motion. He is a moving person. Hermit represents victory, but only if you're alone. It represents triumph, but only if you're alone. It represents reaching your goals, but only if you do so alone. If you are reaching your goals with others, then the hermit represents breaking away from them and not getting where you need to go. Now, as the wanderer, as Wotan, he is also God. But he is a God in search of an answer. In the ancient uh, legends of the Vikings, Wotan was not a very happy camper because he knew there was a Rangrok end of the world type thing coming and that he was going to have to kill Loki which is his son or he's going to be murdered by Loki which is his son and well things didn't look too bright for old Wotan One-Eyes so he wanted to kind of like figure a way to 
change destiny and he was not, at the end he's not able to do it he, he falls prey to his own wisdom I think his wisdom is very wise which is wisdom too um, knows he can't win goes ahead anyways and tries to tries to win very interesting teaching there um, what else can you say about the hermit he's alone man he's you know he's the most bachelor of the bastards. The hermit ain't got nobody. Ain't got nobody to help him out. So, that's the hermit. It's gonna be a short video, I don't know why. Hey, I'm not inspired. I should probably talk, tell you more about these cards, but, yeah. Not that necessary. Alright. And the last card for today. The Wheel of Fortune. Now, for this card, every time that I pull this card for my clients, I have a, a teaching tool, kind of like visual show and tell of what it really means to be in the Wheel of Fortune. So let me go get that. Uh, in the meantime, I just want you to hallucinate a little bit what the symbols here are. We'll go through them. We'll try to it's a very complex card. It's not like Strength or the Hermit. They're very simple cards. The, the Wheel of Fortune is very complex cards. So let me bring my visual to uh, aid, and uh, I'll be right back. You know, I'm a certified rodent enthusiast, and uh, I love rodents. I don't, I'm not too much into hamsters because they're pretty fracking stupid. But I love rats. I love mice. Rabbits. People uh, put these little wheels in their hamster cages. Now, or aquariums. Let me explain. A hamster is not a very bright fellow. He's a, they're very cute, and they put old food in their cheeks, and they're, they're cute little critters, but they're not rats or mice. They are not as clever as right, rats or mice. The proof of that is that you have a, if you have a, an infestation in your house, it's probably not going to be a hamster infestation, it's going to be a rat infestation. Or a mouse infestation. So, People, when they own a hamster, they put them in this aquarium, and inside of the aquarium, they put one of these. And the hamster, being a hamster, uh, climbs on top of this little wheel and runs and runs and runs and runs and runs and runs and runs, and runs, and runs thinking, surely, that running in this wheel, he's going to break out of the cage. So he doesn't get tired. He wants to get out. Nobody wants to be in a cage ever. He runs and runs and runs in his little wheel. And he gets tired and he feels that he's accomplished a great deal because he's run very far, didn't he? Now, I ask you that are human beings and not hamsters, do you think the hamster is actually going to get out of the cage running in this wheel? I don't. So, if you break down all the symbols of this card, you realize that it really just means this. This equals this. This equals this. As human beings, we're a lot closer to the hamsters than we realize. We run and run and run in our lives, our families, our jobs, our careers or uh, universities, whatever. Buy the house, buy the car, buy the dog, kill the dog. Start it all over again. Do we actually get anywhere? Do we actually do anything? President Obama, Michelle Obama, they're, 
in the White House, where everybody wants to be there, everybody wants to have that job, does he actually change human nature through his being president? Can President Obama, which is the apex of success, actually change the world? Can he even change himself? Can he change his bad habits? Maybe he farts, maybe he, you know, picks his nose. Will, be able, will he be able to even change that little aspect of himself? The answer is no. And the answer is no because we are in what is called the Wheel of Karma. The Wheel of Karma specifically states that all of the harm we do to other beings, other sentient beings, is replayed on us after our death, or even sometimes before our death, as a kind of action and reaction of the universe. The universe dedicates all its energy to completing our wishes, to making the things we desire real. Um, but, at a cost. And the cost is that we have desires. If we were in a perfect state, if we were perfect beings, we would have no desires. Desires simply would not exist. But we're not in a perfect state. We're in a human state. And in the human state, we are bound by and trapped by desire. Because desire is what brings us here. Now, I don't know if you guys have read the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, some of you certainly probably have. Um, most of you probably haven't. But in there, it's the, the, the basic teaching is that there's three basic elements that form reality. All of reality is based of three basic elements. The three gunas that they're called in, the, in there. And those elements are ignorance, passion, and compassion or kindness or uh, yeah, compassion. All these three elements combine in various degrees to form our intelligence, our subtle bodies, our, our spirits. Our spirits then create matter around themselves to accomplish the goals of these three elements of reality. Ignorance, passion, compassion. None of these elements are really ever going to let us be free because they, all of them, tie us back to the wheel of karma. Um, now, why is it a wheel? It is a wheel because it has no beginning and no end. Now, you can study the wheel and the symbols within the wheel, but in in essence, what is really important about the wheel itself is its shape. Because its shape is circular. If you, if you go into Goetic, uh, Goetic studies, you will figure out that every single living soul, every single spirit, spirit, not a soul, every spirit, now, let me, I'll, I'll go into that in a second, but let me just say, every single spirit has a symbol, a sigil, be it an angel, be it a, a, de a devil, or be it a human being, or, or, or any type of living entity. It has a symbol within a circle that is within a circle, very much like this, called a sigil, which, if destroyed, destroys the very essence of that being. And that is what you threaten the demons with to make them work with you in Goetic studies. By the way, if you are into the goetic shit and the whole left-hand path and all that, just stop it. Just get the fuck out. You know, just... <laughs> if you think you are so fucking awesome to force any spirit, be it demonic or angelic, into servitude, man, you got nothing coming. It just don't work that way. Because there's a wheel of karma and you will pay it.
So just don't even go there. If you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. Forget about it. Just don't even go there. Goetia is not what you want to be studying. Necromancy is okay. Because, you know, dead folks have been dying all throughout history. And you can talk to them if you want about certain things. They're not going to resent it so much. But goetic shit, using demons, man. How stupid can you... And I can only speak about this because at some occasion, many, many years ago, many moons ago, I kind of studied that shit. And, and uh, folks that were doing it, they, you know, they're, they seem very clever. But when you really delve into it, you figure out they're really stupid. Anyways, we're not talking about Goetia, Goetia right now. I just mentioned it because the, the symbols here... The pair, the, the, this looks like a goetic symbol, this, this wheel, so I wanted to mention that. Um, anyways, don't ask me what letters, what Hebrew letters are there. Don't ask me what symbols. You can see there the water symbol. You can see there the sun symbol. But just, you go for it and look, at it, look it up. Don't be lazy as a tarot reader. Figure out your symbol for yourself, okay? If you really can't find the answer, you can always then send me a message or something. Hey, man, I don't know what that means. What is that letter? Well, that's the letter R upside down, brother. Can't you see that? Yahweh? Okay, anyways. Giving you too much information already, so... If you, uh, if you just look at the uh, four beasts, four angels, eagle, uh, bull, lion, man, well, that's in the Bible, ain't it? That's the four beasts of the Bible. The widest well, the, there's four beasts that are in the, around the throne of God. And there they are, with their wings and everything, and their books. They got their books open. Man, books, more books. So many books in this, this card. Now, here's the, the tricky part. You got... Uh, what do you go? Uh, uh, snakes and ladders is one of the popular children's games. Well, there you got your snakes and ladders. But look at this: the snake is going down. The little devil guy, he's going up. What does that mean? Remember, the soul is trapped in matter, in material existence, but also in spiritual existence. Let me explain now what I mean by soul. And I'm going to have to go to the Vedic meaning of it because the Christian meaning is just fucked up. They just don't have a fucking clue. They're stupid about it. They make you think stupid about it because they confuse soul and spirit because the translations of the Bible are just plain fucking wrong. Okay? So... To really explain the difference between soul and spirit, I have to go to Sanskrit, where you're more clear and there's not so much ignorance. And if you want to blame somebody, go to King James and kick his ass, because he's the one that tran mistranslated the whole Bible. Soul, or the concept of soul. It's called Jiva and is the spark of the Creator that is within us, but it is also the Creator Himself. I'll explain. Okay, there's some pictures of it over here somewhere. Let me just look for them and put them on this video. Yeah, you know what? I'm gonna do that. I'll put the uh, I'll put a little cut in this video and I'll put the picture from uh, the ISKCON uh, pictures of that. Because I want to show you what it really looks like, and it's you know beautiful Hare Krishna kind of way. Anyways, God has an infinite number of forms that it takes, but it has a central form that is the form that holds it all together. The jiva is the part of God that is within our hearts. The heart, the human heart, the cow heart, and the 
dog heart, the two chambered two hearts of the octopus, is the soul. Well, that's trippy. It's the, it's the seat of the soul. It's where the soul lays or stays or exists within a living entity. The center of the rock, the center of the diamond, doesn't have to be. The diamond is a living entity, oddly enough. Embedic, embedic thought. Anyways, the soul is the part of God that is within us. The spirit is the form, the egg-shaped form of desire nature created by the three gunas, by the three elements of nature, of desire nature, that form around the soul to have experiences and to be part of the wheel of karma. The wheel of karma is what goes around the spirit to fulfill its desire nature. Now why is there a serpent going down and a devil going up? Because both of these beings, the serpent and the devil, are all about accomplishing the goals of desire nature. Desire nature says, I'm hungry, I've got to eat, I'm horny, i got to fuck, etc., 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 etc. So the serpent and the devil are both accomplishing those goals, while the sphinx, which is beyond desire nature, and that's the reason that the color is blue, the blue color represents the fact that the sphinx already understands its place or its constitutional surrounding as being trapped within spirit and desire nature and going beyond it so that it can return to the source which is infinite, eternal, etc, 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 which is the jiva, which is God itself, okay? Now the angels, which is this, these four beings that are around the, the, the wheel, do not have desire nature anymore they are tied in or they are functions of the design nature of God himself God doesn't really have design nature either but uh, it does and it doesn't it's a weird thing that anyways the angels are perfectly in tune with the master plan of it all they are they are more potencies than desires and they are fulfilling the Dharma. The Dharma is the books, the books, the sacred books, the sacred texts, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, the, the Talmud, uh, the Book of Enoch, <laughs> the Bible. All of these sacred books have a little bit of the truth in them. All of them passed down through the generations can be utilized by clever demons because those who use the sacred books for their own benefit are demons to control lesser intelligent beings. Now let's go back to the nature of reality. We said there's three forms, ignorance, passion, and uh, compassion. Uh, well, beings that are awake will be living in the element of compassion. Demonic beings are living in the element of ignorance. All the rest live in passion. Motherfucker needs a new skate pipe, man. Anyways, uh, passionate beings are those that have desires, desire nature. Compassionate beings are those that have no more desires for themselves, but are still trying to help others. Ignorant beings are those that confuse things. Certainly a tarot reader uh, is closer to the demonic nature part of it because there's so much to be able to be confused about. But a good tarot reader will be 
more on the angelic side because he'll be trying to help people through his confusion and their confusion. Anyways, uh, the wheel of karma, the wheel of fortune is the wheel of karma. The wheel of karma kind of looks like this. You will run, but you can't hide. Because the world is a little fish tank full of um, hamsters. Wow, okay. That's one, two, three. That's the last one. I think that's the last card. Oh, as far as the uh, divinatory purposes of this card, you're stuck. When you pull this card out, you're just stuck. Let's say the question is, does my husband love me? Oh, yes, he does. He wants to get your cheese. But he's not going to get much cheese out of you, is he? Am I going to be triumphant in my job? Oh, you'll be working at McDonald's for many, many years. You'll even become manager of the store. Yeah. Uh, will I achieve enlightenment? Oh, yes. You will light a light bulb. Anyway, that's the class for today. I hope you like the visual aid. I certainly do. I mean, can you imagine all the people that go to the gyms, you know, like ballets, and, you know, and they spend hours running on one of these things, and they're human beings. What the fuck is wrong with you people? Jesus. Take a walk in the park. By the way, if you're wise about it, you will find out that the park and this little wheel are exactly the same because the cage, the fish tank, is this world. Have a wonderful day. Uh, be blessed and um, don't run too hard.